Hi, welcome to the White Deer Filmmaking Podcast, in association with the White Deer International Film Festival. I'm Alistair Railton, sat here with my friend Mark Wisdom, and Adam Sandy is on the wire at the back. Uh, yes, um, you may notice that we are in a slightly different location today. Uh, we are actually on our own film set. Uh, we've just wrapped production on our latest film, Conviction Without Remorse, um, which we will be doing plenty of behind the scenes uh, things so you can get to know a bit more about how we make films. Um, we'll give you some details here at the end of this uh, this podcast today. Um, so look out for that. Yeah, yeah. So um, who do we have today, Al? Well, today we have Owen Cleland, who is representing his film Ups and Downs. Ups and Downs won Best Feature in our September, October uh, bi-monthly category. Mm. Very good film. Mm. Very good. In fact, um, this was my... Um, the one that I'm most emotionally connected to, mm. simply because it has a lot of um, topics in there which are very close to my heart, and it captured them beautifully. Um, as a brief sort of intro as to what the film is about, uh, it's about a, a, a family with a Down syndrome uh, son in there, and it's it's very much not trying to explore that. Oh, you've got a special needs person in your family. It is just they're your brother, they're your son. They are just part of the family, and like anyone else, they have, you know, they're annoying at times or they're heartwarming at times. So it's just it captured it beautifully. Um, but. You'll get that in the in the interview, so um, hope you really enjoy it, and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we have Owen. Now, didn't ask about how you pronounce your surname. <laughs> That's all right, Cleland. Cleland, Cleland. okay. Yeah. Um, who is the um, director and writer for the uh, film Ups and Downs, um, which, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank it you. Was, yeah. It's amazing it's great to be here. Um, that you, you've... Well, I guess just to talk to us about um, everything regarding your your film, and um, I guess start very simply. Um, what? How did the uh, the idea behind the film sort of begin for you? So um, yeah, so the basic gist of the film is it's about a brother and sister who go on a brother who tricks his sister into going on a road trip to a gig in, uh, to escape their overbearing mom when he's supposed to have his first job interview, and the guy's got Down syndrome, and um, so. My sister is down, it's something that's always obviously, you know, been in the back of my mind that you never, you rarely see people with Downs on TV or film, and when you do, there are these amazing, angelic, huggy, lovely, perfect people who exist only to inspire and forever to go how brave they are, or occasionally, if it's a very serious drama, they're out of focus in the background while mum weeps counting money. But, you know, they're never, they're never people, they're never... You know, but my between my sister and her friends and blah blah blah. You know, the people with Downs are like everybody else. They have good days. They have bad days. They they can be grumpy. They can be manipulative. They can be you know they present one thing and they mean the other and all those things that you normally do when you're writing any character. They're like, oh, what's what's interesting about this person? What are the contradictions? Why are you know what are they with this person versus what are they with that person? And so I wanted to write a character who had Downs. <clears throat> who was um yeah who could be manipulative and who could be selfish and who could be grumpy and all those other things as well as being brave and thoughtful and sweet and and, you know just just obviously i wanted to create a a, a character with downs who was who's rounded um and so yeah it's always sort of i never it took a long time to figure out what the longer version of it. it existed as a short film for about eight or nine years i was trying to get it made um and you know, it kind of was the basic idea was like, why can't I do Stand by Me, but with a brother and a sister, where one of them has Downs? You know, like our Cal, you know Calvin and Hobbes. Like initially, there was the idea. The first image was like them walking through the woods, and him, this guy who sort of thought himself as like the Terminator, and he just initially had like a long black neo trench coat and. Uh, and all this sort of stuff, and then the sister in the school uniform, and I like I love the Im- the sort of cartoony image of you know him towering over her and stuff. Now, obviously, as production goes on and things change, you know that doesn't. Matter. That was the initial image was like the two of them sort of stand by me, you know, walking through the countryside with him, you know, in his head being you know out of the Matrix or Terminator or whatever, and her just being the sort of small schoolgirl, you know, and then and their dynamic that sort of dynamic was something I wanted to write, and just took a while. Yeah. No, um, but well. That definitely came across. I think one of the things which uh, stood out for me when watching was uh, was that dynamic, and that um, despite her being obviously still in school, there's elements where she cares for him, but he also cares for her in, in different ways, but 
together they form a really strong relationship as brother and sister, which is exactly like what an everyday brother and sister would do. Um, but you're right, definitely from, from my, my own experience, it, it is just that. It is just like a normal relationship in most occasions. Um, so... In well, my opinion, captured it very well. Yeah. Very th- well. Thanks very much. Well, the and I agree with you. It was you know sort of ninety percent sibling relationships. You know, mm. like everybody else might go, oh, she, you know, she's special and blah blah blah. But I mean, at the end of the day, she's watching a cartoon that you don't want to watch, or she's eating the last of the good cereal, yeah. so you have the bad cereal. All the other stuff that you have with your siblings, where you're like, no, don't you know? Or mom's letting her off with you know this, and I would get crucified for that. I think the the big difference for me from a coming of age story thing is. Um, I'm a my uh, my sister who's partly inspired by is older than I am by two years, um, so I started out as the little brother, but as kind of with special needs or whatever. As as I got older, I you know, equal, and then I became the more mature one or whatever way you want to look at it. So suddenly, you know, I was being allowed responsibilities and so on that she wasn't, and that was kind of tricky enough for the dynamic because by and large, when siblings mature you know, they mature at the same pace and the older brothers, the older sister dynamics kind of stay in place. Whereas with special needs, it can, it can change, especially if it's an older sibling, it can, those can change. And I thought the idea of that was kind of interesting of the younger sibling having to be the older sibling, but still the older sibling going, no, 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 hold on. You know, this is, you know, um, so yeah, that, that was something I wanted to play with a little bit, but yeah, I just wanted to capture, you know, that sort of bickering. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Um, um, so, I mean, what would you say was the um, uh, the standout moments from from making this film? What were the kind of real well the highlights? Well, you know, well, we approached it. We didn't have a massive budget from the BBC. Um, for um, no, we had a massive budget compared to anything else I've ever made <laughs> in my entire life. Um, and you know not a massive budget for TV is still a ridiculous amount of money to spend on anything, you know, so when they're going, you, you're in charge of it, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. Um, yeah. But we had, you know, from a TV point of view, a relatively low budget and the smart thing would have been to go, right, well, they're in a room and they're talking and, you know, maybe even they have a house party, but it was always had to be a road trip for me, which meant that, you know, I was going to have, and I, you know, I've always, when I did my shorts and stuff, I've always been like, oh, okay, every time it's an excuse to be like, okay, right, well, can we do a, can we do a stunt scene? Can we do a car bit? Can we do a, have to throw a house party? Can we set something on fire? Like, and it's always just an excuse to do something stupid. And so when I had this R, I was like, right, what are all, and generally how it works is I come up with a list of 10 things to hand the producer. The producer goes, okay, we're going to afford to do five of these. You take five of them out in the rewrite. And then of that five, by the time you get the production, it's four, and then one of them drops out in production. So you've got two or three really cool things, which is fine because each of those cool things is a production nightmare. And so I was like, you know, so that's a fine, you know, you kind of ask for the world and then you scale back. That's yeah. that's cool. Uh, and with this, I sort of went, right, I want these 10 ridiculous things. I want a car chase. Uh, well, sorry, I want a tractor chase. I want stunts. <laughs> I want a crowd yeah. scene. I want the scene in a school. I want a gig scene. I want city center at night. I want drone footage. I want, you know, and I just yeah. asked for all these things and I oh, want a punch and a stunt fall and blah blah, blah and an open top and uh, yeah the producer came back and said well I mean at the moment you have five days worth of night shoots if you could rewrite two scenes so they took place indoors so we didn't have to then it was four days of night shoots and I was like okay and what else now no no that's it I said oh okay great <laughs> okay, yeah. so, which we was yeah. which was brilliant but it was also a nightmare because then I had to figure out how to do because every one of those things you ask for the reason you're like making a mental list is Right, well, if I have to do a gig scene, that's a day, you know, or if I have to do a stunt scene, that's going to be, you know, or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, there were a couple of great, like, a couple of particularly great moments. Um, the uh, film in the, the, we opened with the, I'd never done low loader stuff before, you know, we put a vehicle in a trailer and move it around. Uh, we had to do that for the tractor chase sequence, and uh, that was the first two days. And, you know, James had theater acting experience, but never acted on camera before. Yeah. I'd never done stunts before, and suddenly, you know, and we had no time to do, you know, and every, and it's one of those things, we had a wee small country lane, every time you drive down the country lane, you have to do just 20 minutes reset or half an hour reset and stuff. Yeah. So it was just every, every shot kind of, so that was really high pressure, but also really, you know, you're just going, this is cool. Every, you know, it's yeah. not that thing every time I have on set and I've, you know, been on quite a few sets now, but anyhow, I'm in charge going, these people are, are here for me to do this. So, you know, and James is such a, James and, and Susan, 
uh, are so lovely and, and rosy. I've got to be that guy's like, oh, the whole cast were lovely, but they, they were. So that was great. Um, the city centre stuff at night, uh, for the montage, we decided we didn't need sound, which meant we could just go and gorilla it, which was really nice. Just the, you know, being on this bigger BBC production, we have had all those great, but necessarily and occasionally slightly slow processes of just having sort of five of us in the centre of Belfast going, what about that street? No, I don't like the MTP going, no, 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 like, we'll just go down, run over there. Yeah, great. I mean, do we need to slate this? No, we're not, no, with no sound, we'll not even slate it. And that really felt back to like the, me and two mates with a camera just going, right, what can we get away with before the cops stop us? You know, and that was, it felt a little bit like that. Um, once or twice. So yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, all the stunt stuff, anytime we got to do something, you know, or crowd scenes or in school, anytime you got to do something where you're, that you couldn't do with your mates, like filming in a school is cool, you know, then getting the guy, you know, just all that sort of stuff uh, was great. Um, the open top bus was miserable because it was, even though it's nice and sunny and stuff, yeah. it was uh, mid-November when we were filming and you're traveling down the road and it was already cold and windy. And yeah. one of the extras is, he's like, Mr. Extra in Northern Ireland, he's done everything and he's done, you know, every season of Game of Thrones. So he's laying in the mud oh. at, you know, for every battle scene. And he's like, that's the coldest I've ever been on any set <laughs> in my life. It was, it was, yeah. but then, you know, it's great. You return the camera, the actors are all like, ah, you know, like Jack Nicholson at the end of The Shining. And then you're like, ah, and action. And suddenly they all spring to life and everything's yeah. lovely and wonderful. And then the moment you call cut, everyone's like, oh, no, kill me. <laughs> Um, so that was that was fun. But yeah, no, that I mean, it's not very exciting to say, but like the whole process was was really good. Like the bar one or two minor production, you know, the usual things happen once or twice, or for half an hour. You go, what do you mean we don't have X, Y, and Z? But you know, then you go right. Well, we don't have X, Y, and Z. Point the camera the other way, and we'll figure it out. Yeah. So brilliant. Um, I, I guess leading on from that, um, uh, almost a two part question. So you mentioned like how how your experience on making things with your friends on projects where you have very little budget, if not at all, um, how much of that made you rethink certain moments? Like were you were you conscious of that at all times? Did it mean make mean that you were more um, innovative when it came to a few things? Or um, but also, what where where did you go from that to get to working with the BBC and having all of this to work with uh it's there is there a certain moment for you which is like yeah that you know i just that that worked so i just applied or something like that yeah well um <clears throat> I've, i don't and it didn't go to film school but just when i was in uni doing a computers degree i just i hung you know, found some filmmakery types in the film sock and, and i just made a bunch of stuff and you know like a lot of people just trial and error just made stuff yeah. made bad stuff made you know marginally less bad stuff and made you know so I did that for, for years and, and, you know, then got a job out of university, wasn't really planning to, but managed to get a, a tech support job for a, a um, documentary company. So then my day job became sort of working in, in docs and, and that stuff. And then just in the spare time, I was still I was always writing scripts and, and directing and, and doing bits and pieces. And, you know, every time you do it, you just, you know, you're like, right, well, that was terrible. Why, you know, next time I'm not going to do that. Next time I'll, you know, and you know, when you work with a new DP, your new DP is like, have you ever thought about, you know, moving the camera this way or you start the scene with this sort of shot or whatever? And you're like, oh, okay, you know, so every time you're doing stuff, you're, you're, you're picking up bits and pieces. Um, and I spent about 10 to 15 years making shorts and I made a, like, I made a no budget feature nobody cared about. Like, and I said, I'm like really no budget. And, you know, I made a bunch of shorts and stuff and then I, did a couple of web things over here for the RT, the, the broadcaster, and, you know, a couple short, some short films that weren't particularly well received. And then and finally, I made something that, like a short film that was, that was well received, um, which was good because then, and as I said earlier, I tried for a couple of years to make ups and downs and I, I couldn't get it off the ground. And then the BBC and I had this slot and there was basically an open call for the one to do two dramas, contemporary, Northern Ireland, not history, not troublesy, not pref not preferably very crimey because we already have like the fall and stuff. So, it kind of doesn't act. You know, it sounds like I mean, you're like, mm, okay, it has to be first. You know, it doesn't actually leave you with that many options. I've submitted ups and downs. They responded well to it, um, and then I don't think they were that keen on the idea of, of me directing it. Uh, you know, I think they were looking for someone with more a bit more experience, safer pair of hands, which I totally understand. 
uh, what I kept sort of saying was like I um, I get that and there are loads of really good directors but and there are some there are a couple of cracking directors in Northern Ireland Bad Day for the Cut I don't know if you've seen it it's on Netflix fantastic fantastic local thriller um, what do you call it just came out from the Good Vibrations guys uh, with Liam Neeson in it um, Ordinary Love anyway it's a bunch of a brilliant director you know The Dig came out there's really cool stuff happening in Northern Ireland but not all of it's the same, luckily the same sensibility that I have and I was like look the you know, just make sure if you get a director for this, it has to be a director who understand who understands the tone of it and can get the light. Because like on the page, you know, the the, the brother sister bickering and the mum's concern could just be an hour of people shouting at a guy with disabilities. <laughs> you get that tone wrong. You just like, yeah. and so I think the you know, I, I say it. I'd had that short that was fine. You know, finally had that short that was like well received and caught a couple of awards here and there. Um, but I think it was more so me going, hey, I, you know, just make sure there's a lightness of tone to this that it feels, you know. And I think eventually the BBC sort of went, well, this guy seems to know what the tone he wants is and needs. And if we get this wrong, it could, you know, nobody wants to do anything offensive. And not it's not a very controversial film as long as you're kind of getting it right. But as I say, if it this is something, when the sister's letting loose at the brother, that... If you if that goes too dark, that could go too dark. You know what I mean. So, um, and as for as far as like production wise, yeah, I mean, I I'm sort of I always write with one head in production. I've just because I started writing, I always I've always written stuff that I wanted to make, even when I'm writing stuff that I, at the time other people were going to make. I'm always aware that like right, well, someone's going to need to figure out. You know, I can't write. You know. 15 pages in a school because that would take up you know i can't write loads and loads of stuff you know i say so are those wee bits and pieces that are, well you know okay that that's going to be a stunt and that's going to be chase but i always had in the back of my a lot of the time in the back of my mind i'm like all oh, right well the simpler way to do that is going to be it's not a sports car it's a regular car or yeah. <laughs> you know the, the guy doesn't get punched he get he runs away or you know there's always you've always got the kind of like look worst comes to worst she can just say this and the scene will end or we'll hand wave it or we'll get a bit of idea. So, you know, I always approach with that in mind of like, what's the, right, what can we try and get away with? And if, if that feels, because that's the only way to direct, like, because inevitably, even on a good production like this where the producers were brilliant and pretty much everything went planned, there were a couple of people, you know, who are things that happened or weather or streets being like, you know, the places that we wanted to film. And then, you know, if there was a fire and the whole street was closed and you're like, right, well, we're not filming, you know, stuff like that. We are like, that's not anyone's fault, but that's not happening. And, you know, uh, that's, I mean, that's the director's job is a lot of the time just to figure out, right. That's all great. You had a great idea there. That's lovely. Well done. But okay, we actually have to make this. So what do we, uh, what, how do we do that? Fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, I think sort of, sort of tied into that is, um, did you have any of the crew that you worked with previously on other films that you've done, or was it all a new film crew for you? So it was, as a director, was it a challenge working with new people? Or um, it was. It was almost an entirely new crew. We just we hit a very busy spot uh, last. It was last October. You know, sorry about October before last. Um, where there were either seven or eight productions filming simultaneously. So there's the last season of Game of Thrones, there was Line of Duty, there was, you know, a, a whole bunch, the whole raft of stuff. So just getting anybody was difficult on our budget right. level. You know, we're competing with stuff that has a budget. You know, an episode of Game of Thrones could literally make roughly 60, you know, for the final season, you could roughly make 60, of, 60 hours of our show for, you know what I mean? Because... <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe not quite that much, but not far off. Anyway, you, you know what I'm talking. Anyway, the, so um, so a lot of other guys I'd worked with for and girls I'd worked with for weren't available. But um, we had a fantastic producer, and the other thing was um, every pr every HOD bar one, every head of department bar one was stepping up. So they um, you know, costume design like they were they'd all been assistants on Game of Thrones for eight years, nine years or whatever, but hadn't had the chance chance to like run an entire department. So we got some brilliant people and everyone was then there's a great sort of let's put on a show spirit because everybody was like, Right, this is I'm this I'm costuming this, I'm art departmenting this, I'm whatever it is. So, you know, everybody was ready to sort of step up and do because, you know, we didn't have much time, we didn't have much money, you know, and but everyone because it was a sort of like right, everyone was allowed to take ownership of it. 
and they were all again and I know it's not very exciting but they were all so lovely they were all so lovely you know uh, that no it wasn't difficult working with them at all the first AD I hadn't worked with her as a first AD before but I'd worked with her sort of six years previously in documentaries sort of thing right. so that was handy um, and it was great uh, because uh, James was uh, the lead actor and um, yeah. I was sort of going I there's two types of first, broadly speaking. There's the kind of quiet, just you know, and then there's the right every you know, the the drill. A lot of you know, first ADs are drill sergeants, and I don't respond well to that. I don't like stressy sets. I like every, you know, I like a very relaxed set. So it's like yeah. my for James's sake, James's. It's very important we get a relaxed first AD. It's very important you know, for James, for James, you know, and then. Well, nothing to do with James. I just I, I I can't cope with someone being stressy on set because then it, everybody gets stressed. So we got this first AD Emma, who's brilliant, very low key, you know, just like okay, great, let's do that, you know. So yeah. uh, and that I think that then permeates through. And James is so charming, lovely, and I uh, was lucky enough to work with um, Susan Lynch, who was mm. is is a brilliant actor, but you know she was. The three things she'd done previously were Killing Eve, Doctor Who, and Ready Player One. So you're kind of like, I'll just give direction to this woman. What, who's the last person who directed her? Steven Spielberg. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I just, you know. No, and, and she never, you know, I, but I never felt like she was going, you're an idiot. <laughs> and maybe that's because she's a really good actor. <laughs> she's really good at hiding that you're an idiot. But you know what I mean? Everybody was was, was very nice. Like, um, And as I say, you know, James is such a, lovely warm presence and you know and james is very well he takes it seriously that he knows his lines and and is doing the role he's also just a big bundle of energy you know that comes in and 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 winds people up and slags them off and has a bit of crack with everybody and stuff so um yeah no it was it was surprisingly disappointingly for a podcast point of view disappointingly straightforward yeah um, just quickly speaking of the the actors, how did you um, did you have much involvement yourself with with um, saying who you wanted to be in in the film, or was that separate from you? Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, uh, so James, I like for the BBC read the script. They're like, well, like the script, you know, can we cast this? And I was like, yeah, of course, I know just the guy. I did not know just the guy. I was bluffing uh, madly. <laughs> I was like, I know someone. I like, I know I'll find someone. So I then just did a trawl of every Downs group in Northern Ireland, pretty much, which is about 14 different Downs groups, and just auditioned a load of people. Someone had said to me, you need to meet James. And um, so there's a drama group that locally that had been like doing theatre-y stuff for like 13 years. So we'd done a bunch of theatre, never done screen acting. Um, so it was really good. And when I met him, I was like, this guy I came home to my wife, had a bit filmed on the phone. It was like, it's not just me, right? This guy, this guy's got it, right? And she's like, yeah, that, guy, that guy's great. And so... Uh, I find you know um, I found James through a kind of fairly exhaustive search, and then everyone else was well, uh, most almost everyone else bar Susan was then just kind of open casting calls uh, through the local agency. It's that thing of just watch loads of people in here, like oh, she, you know, he's good, you know. And then sometimes you've got one idea of a character, and that completely goes out the window, which happened once or twice, and definitely for the better. And then Susan was just an offer because you know, she's well known locally, and we were just like she's perfect. And she'd also Susan had done quite a bit of comedy earlier in her career, um, you know, Waking Ned and that sort of thing, and and and, uh, but recently had only played sort of you know dark roles like, like I say Killing Eve and, and, and stuff so she was kind of keen enough to do you know something a bit lighter and a bit more fun and, and so on so yeah we, we got her through that um, and yeah as I say everyone else was, was sort of open open casting and sometimes you know the characters change quite a bit when you're casting but then you get the person and that's the, the beauty of being a writer director is being able to go that's the, the, one of the best is being able to roll with the punches in the best way, you know, and go like, right, okay, I thought he'd be this, but he's actually that, but that's great. We can, we can just, we'll just do a wee quick pass to, and sometimes it's not even a rewrite. You're just like, oh, no, 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 just lean into performing it this way. Mm -hmm. Just to pretend you don't notice that at all, or you do, or whatever. So, uh, but yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 What's, um, just out of interest, uh, uh, what sort of um, lessons or experiences mm -hmm. did you learn on this film? Uh, that you'll be taking forward into future projects? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I 
I've learned nothing. No, uh, there's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, you know, there's a, there's some technical stuff you learn every time you work with a new DP. I learn like like for example, I've been filming stuff for about fifteen, making shorts for about fifteen years, and I always went handheld. But the DP it was like, I don't do handheld. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I mean, and he would have if I'd pushed him, but it was clearly not his thing. And I was like, maybe we don't need, you know, I'm talking with him then. So, and there were two bit, two or three bits where I was like, I really want handheld. And he was like, ended up being handheld on a bit of a rig, you know, like yeah. he just, he doesn't. So there's a bunch of technical stuff there I learned about, like a bit more about composition and so on. Um, and uh, there's some stuff in the edit about how to like, a lot of stuff about taking notes and how to negotiate with people because just everybody has their own, you know, um, and pit the, the ex- I was very lucky with the execs. And no, I'm, it sounds like I'm contractually obligated to say that, but it was, I was just very lucky with the execs. Every, you know, was more or less in the same page. But when you get into the final edit, there's some people who are like, do we need that bit? Let's lose that bit. And as the okay, director goes, it's the hardest bit. This is the most important. Yeah. Everything, and everything's the most important bit. Yeah. So, you know, so, uh, yeah, making sure that everybody feels hurt. Like, it's a bit trickier on the bigger scale. It's making sure that everybody feels hurt. You can get away with it's you and three mates filming something. Then, you know, it's pretty obvious if Sarah's not happy or whatever. But, you know, when there's a bigger crew of, like, right, you know, I've overruled the sound guy four times in a row. I might need to let give the sound guy a victory, even if I don't think we need to do another take for sound or whatever it is. Or that exec has let me away with the last eight arguments, even though I don't really want to agree with him on this one. If he feels strongly about that, you know, so there's uh, some stuff about diplomacy and I'm already a reasonably, I don't like, I'm a conflict averse, don't like arguing. So, but yeah, learning kind of figuring out what people want, you know, when they're, you know, reading people, you know, that's so important. That's as important as your shots is just making sure your crew are happy and that everybody feels, you know, and lines of lines of communication on a bigger thing. Sometimes you're like, yeah, it's fine. You know, again, if it's a small crew just on the day, but making sure everybody's prepped, everybody knows what, what they're doing and always, always have a fallback plan. But it's, I mean, it's not, you sort of think, oh, once I get a bigger crew, more money, it'll be a complete night and day thing. And I, obviously this isn't Transformers, I'm sure if you're on Transformers or whatever it is a night day. But, you know, it's if you've done anything even big, you know, if you've done a short film, if you've done anything like, certainly if you've done a small funded short film, you know, if you've had anything where anybody got paid, it's pretty much the same, you know, just be, you know, be prof- friendly, balance the friendliness and professionalism. Um but yeah, I'm sure there's a bunch of other stuff I realize, you know, there's always, let's say, a bunch of things where you're like, oh, that, like, you work with the editor and you see how he cuts things and, or whatever, and you're like, oh, that's a night, we, you know, next time you come up against a scene like that, you're going to try that wee thing or whatever, but yeah. Brilliant, but that's um, very good insight, actually. We've not, we've not really sort of touched on that so much about um, being diplomatic as you say on set uh, in our previous podcast so that's that's perfect mm. that's that's really good information thank you very much for, for bringing that up it's fantastic one, of, one um, of the the best ways i heard that put on a podcast was that people talk about the note behind the note um so that yeah. sometimes if you get a note from like this isn't happening directly on this this is you know but the, the, the sort of typical example is the exact goes the main character needs to have a, a dog and you're like what and, you know when suddenly they need to, they'd have a dog or they need to give money to a homeless person or whatever it is and like this but what the, the note behind the note is, I don't like the lead character. And then you look at it again, and you're like, oh, you don't like the lead character because you don't know what the lead character, what she wants for the first 15 pages of the script. So she's just ambling around. So just in order to get a kind of foothold on what the character wants, the exec is going, give her a dog, give her a, make, make her nice to a homeless person, give her, what Moni's basically saying is, give me a reason to care about this person, which is usually, I don't know what they want and why they can't have it. So, and that's the note behind the note. And you get a lot of, stuff like that where you're just where you're talking to crew or you're talking to an exec and you know they're going um why doesn't he drive her why doesn't you drive a, a red car or whatever and you're like why and so just trying to figure out everyone you know art department you're like why why do you want a red car and like oh right well they're worried that this scene's gonna look drab and they want to keep make sure the visual sensibility of the whole thing is you know upbeat and then you're like well, well hold on we don't want to make a cartoon so, so a lot of the time when you're like i don't like that it's just taking a step back and going right well what are you trying to achieve with that idea what am i trying to achieve and how do we get these two to work 
together with you know because generally speaking people have very good ideas you know i'm not an auteur theory guy generally speaking like if someone's from an art department or from costume or an exec or whatever they've done it for thousands of hours more than you have you might as well take their ideas and if you're bouncing against them trying to figure out what they're trying to do and why that's not gelling will usually get you to the third thing which isn't what they want or what you want it's what both of you will realize that you want you know yeah yeah collaboration isn't it it's all about collaboration and working as a team in the best way you possibly can there's always going to be some sort of argument or some sort of clash but if you can find that middle ground hopefully you'll make the, the project even better oh yeah absolutely absolutely um, well just a, a few final questions Owen. Mm-hmm. um so what are you working on next is there something that you've got in the pipeline uh, a couple of different things um uh none of them concrete at the moment so you know i'm i'm, I'm writing a, a crime sort of five minutes in the future black murder crime series thing um, and developing a, a kids tv show that was animation but now there's a scheme locally for like live action things so i'm, I'm trying to develop for that um, i have a couple of other of other bits and bobs uh I would love to do something more with Ups and Downs. It was really nice. We got to go out to America with it. I got played at a couple of American festivals and did yeah. uh, sort of like one um, best TV movie at like uh, NYC film, or sorry, yeah, NYC TV festival, which was really nice. And uh, got to go out and be interviewed by the guy who co-created Angel uh, and stuff, which is a massive nerd, was like yeah. really, ex- <laughs> you know, really, really exciting and stuff. So, I, you know, I'd, I'd love at some point something more to happen you know i'd love to do more ups and downs or you know do something with it um and a bunch of other stuff that's just bubbling away so yeah i don't i, I don't know um i have a very small baby at the moment or a six month old baby so it's it's been a bit of a it's been a bit of a whirlwind and you know my wife and i are both sort of self-employed so i'm working from home so ba- balancing all of that and the writing and stuff has been has been fun but um yeah, there's that's the thing of sometimes you know you just you're uh, you sort of think that um, you know you'll finish this and people will line up and you know it's, uh, here's a you know four picture deal kid you know you're in the movies now it doesn't quite work like that but you know I've had uh, uh, you know people have been nice about it and um, you know chatting chatting to agents and so on but uh, the agents all want to see the next thing so I'm just the next thing just needs another another wee polish and so on so yeah no it's all it's all touch wood going quite well but there's nothing in the immediate in the immediate pipeline you're always just working on the next thing hoping you know yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's odd I've, I've talked to a couple of professionals like uh you know one of them a big name one of them a kind of fairly solidly working director and they both said the same thing which is they both are like yeah yeah at any given moment i have about 10 projects in development and they're like 10 projects you know and these are, they, you know one of these guys is, is a reasonably big name and then i'll say the other one's kind of a constantly working direct you probably wouldn't recognize the name but he's done loads and loads of stuff and it's like both of them same thing which is you just have, you don't know which one will go so you just keep developing stuff and it just takes mm-hmm. a while so uh yeah that's um that's that's the plan hopefully something will come through yeah so what is the the sort of if you picture yourself in like 10 20 years time what will be the ultimate goal for you uh, uh, i'd love like to see yeah, I, I don't know. I'd love, like, I'd show running a TV series. You know, it used to be yeah. back in the day, it's like, oh, I want to make movies. But I mean, I don't, yeah, yeah obviously, if someone wants to make movies, yeah. I'd love to make movies. But yeah. the, the I, I love collaboration. I have a couple of friends who are writers who have helped me with previous projects. I say mm-hmm. the next thing I'm doing, I'm, I'm co writing or whatever. So I love the TV model. Like, I daydreamed a bit about ups and, when we we're making ups and downs of like, you know, oh, it'd be great to do a series and then she could write one and he could direct one and she could direct the, you know, and I would get to oversee it and I'd get to do, you know, one of the episodes or three of the episodes or whatever it is. So that really appeals to me of just mm-hmm. like the volume that you get with a TV show now, the chance to collaborate again of like having a little mini writer's room and being like, okay, well, what do you, th- oh, yeah, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I'd love to ultimately, you know, similar enough to have what I did have with ups and downs which is you know a lot of creative control of something that I made you know it was such I was spoiled it's such a dream you know before that I I'd written a couple of episodes of some Irish soaps and you know bits and pieces here and there but you know being allowed to write and direct ups and downs and everybody being like right well you seem to know what you're doing with this just go ahead and do it, it was so you know because I had other experiences where I'd you know worked on smaller 
on other things where you know there were a lot more notes and stuff. So yeah, something basically just doing something like ups and downs. Whether it's something a slice of life ups and downs, or whether it's a mad genre show or whatever, I don't really. There's I've interest in lots of different things, but the ability to, like I say, to write and direct my own stuff, but also to be like, oh right, well, Aidan's written an episode and Lisa's directing it, and I just need to come in and go, like, oh right, we'll try a bit of that and a bit of that, you know, that sort of thing sounds awesome. So yeah, 20, 20 years time if TV still exists, then that would be the dream. You'd be on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll uh, we'll certainly look out for you. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I loved ups and downs, and I think that's it's lovely so for you to say. Yeah. We'll hopefully see more of those, um, and all the best if um, for, for getting those done and for, for everything you do in the future, because obviously it seems to be going quite well. So really certainly really seems to be that way. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that was Thank lovely you chatting, you guys. Thanks very much. All the best, and cheers for your support. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, listening or watching that. Um, it was a real pleasure to speak to Owen. Um, he really, well, he, I think he's a perfect example of how to take what you've been learning with no budget at all to a what, BBC level film. I mean, really good. Um, and he, just a great guy. I really, yes. really enjoyed speaking yes. to him, really enjoyed it. Um, so, well, what we'll do is we'll put all of Owen's um, social media below so you can follow him and get in touch with him if you want to. Um, but just to touch briefly on where we are, because I did say we were going to do this before, and it's worth mentioning, Al, It certainly you. is. So uh, we are on our film set for our most recent film, Conviction Without Remorse. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we are filmmakers ourselves, so if you are ever interested in uh, following the work that we do, we have a bank of films to our name now that we're more than happy to share with you. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, social media, under the name Fresh Air Films and Media. Mm -hmm. You can visit our website, www.freshairfilmsandmedia.co.uk, uh, and check out all of our latest work. Excellent. Just one thing. What's on the wire, me? <laughs> Al? What's yeah, on the wire? Well, you know, you just... He's playing with wires in the background. Yeah, is it a step on up from tech? tech? <laughs> you earned your promotion. Let's yeah, yeah. <laughs> see what I get next week. <laughs> uh, thank you for listening, everyone. Um, see ya.